Hey, David, uh, it's such a pleasure always to talk to you. You're, you're simply amazing, of course. You're just outstanding, all the work that you're doing. You, you have so many titles, so many contributions, so many awards. Uh, you're, you belong to so many different organizations and all implementing and executing globally in some meaningful way. It's just an incredible contribution you're making to the planet. So thank you for coming in and sharing your insights with the audience. Well, it's great to be here with you, Stephen, and thank you for everything you do as well as a, a thought leader's uh, strategy, um, global strategy. You you, you advise multiple uh, companies and countries. And again, I think we both share in common that we really want to deliver results differently and better. Like you said, operationalize those strategies and put them into motion. So one of the first things I want to do is I, I've got to encourage the audience. I've got to look at your profile. So the profile is shared with the interview and it's, it's long, but it's worth looking at it. And they, you get the you get a good idea where David is uh, implementing and executing. And of course, you can reach out to him through LinkedIn or or whatever and tag him and say, David, we don't want you to you know, come into our project or something. Well, he does it all. <laughs> so really encourage the audience to take a look. Now, in prior interviews, I talked about inflection points in your life. So we we got over your history. And again, I'll encourage the audience just to look at the prior interviews. Since we last talked, though, maybe you can do an update of some of your activities. Sure. Um, since we last chatted, uh, uh, have had the honor and privilege to be helping multiple organizations, one of which is uh, Health Level 7. I can talk about Health Level 7 is the international nonprofit, 501c3 that oversees all the standards involving data uh, associated with healthcare records and medical records. And so I was fortunate enough to be invited to give a closing keynote at a Harvard medical event back in August, uh, given the roles that I did with the bioterrorism program back in 2000, when we did use flavors of AI at the time, not generative AI, but expert systems and decision support systems uh, to deal with the response to 9-11 and then the anthrax events and the original coronavirus SARS. And as a result of that keynote at Harvard, then HL7 said, we really want to think about how do medical and health data standards fit into the AI world? Because as, as you probably know, talking to different companies right now, a lot of AI companies are not thinking about interoperability. Uh, they're thinking it's going to be you know one, one AI system to rule them all, when probably in the world we're going into, you're going to have different AI systems for different hospitals, different medical settings, and the like. And, and so we're going to need that interoperability. So I've parachuted in and are working with them. And one of the things, there, there's really two things we want to put forward, which is first, it would be really useful in your medical chart, in your health record, if you record the provenance, the origin of something in your medical record as either coming from a human and which human, was it a clinician, was it a uh, lab technician, whatever, or did it come from an AI? And if so, what AI was it and what system and what 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 flavor of it was it um, that was operating. And so that's a minor thing that in terms of, it, it's it's an easy thing to do on a standard side, but making sure we have that interoperability across all the companies is going to be key. And that's something that we've been behind the scenes working and in fact are now looking for um, ideally global adoption. The second thing that we're looking at is for better or for worse, generative AI is really good at creating authentic looking content that's been generated by a machine, which means in the healthcare medical space, uh, there's going to be, unfortunately, a whole lot of realistic looking medical claims that are, in fact, fraudulent. And so how can we do defense in depth at the medical record standards and the healthcare standards so that it's harder for fraudsters to either create realistic looking claims that are fraudulent or the other side of the equation, if you're submitting authentically to get prior authorization, because in the United States, we have to get that often. Uh, how do you make sure that your claim is actually considered and adjudicated and not automatically turned down, uh, which may be, you know, again, if we're, not, if we're not careful, some may use generative AI to automatically turn down claims without duly considering them. So that's just one example. Um, and I'm happy to dive into more. Um, some of it involves interesting things with satellites and space um, quietly lurking on that commercialization of space. Some of it actually involves thinking about uh, how we can actually do distributed or decentralized um, connections to quantum computers, because uh, that's going to be something that's going to be needed in the future. And then finally, really just thinking about how we get ahead of the democratization, the continued democratization of tech from bio to space to AI in a way that uplifts free and open societies um, and makes sure that we continue to coexist peacefully on the planet. You know, it's really, really fascinating and all uh, very meaningful, and it's going to, you know, make a positive contribution. 
So this next question is is a little bit different, and that is, and for example, I, I'm um, speaking at a conference of uh, over 400 CEOs at the Sistel Institute uh, next week, mm -hmm. then doing a, another uh, talk with the Asian Leadership Conference, and then the week after I'm at WISIS, the World Summit, and then AI for Good. But one of the things that I've been asked to put together is, um, what are really good resources for CEOs? And this is on anything uh, related to AI. And so what would you recommend? And then what I can do is from the, your recommendation, I'll say, take a look at David's interview because he talks about all the great, and, and it's vetted, right? Because if David yep. recommends it, then they're vetted and they, they can be trusted. So so can you can you name some of the top yeah, resources? That's a good question. Um... Well, so the first thing I would say is part of what makes our era so interesting is the the compression of cycles. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen this as well, that, you know, one of the interesting consequences of one, the good news is we're increasingly becoming connected as a planet. You know, more than half of the world is now connected to the Internet. Uh, we still have more work to do to bring uh, the other the next three, 3.5 billion people online. But we succeeded past the 50 percent point. But one of the consequences is the 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 OODA loops, the orient observe decide act loops are getting tighter and tighter. And so in the past, I could recommend a book um, or I could recommend you go and read the following articles. I, I almost worry now that by the time it gets codified into a book, the world has already moved on. And so I don't know if I can recommend. I mean, I, I, I still value books, but I recognize that if you want to be really at the cusp of where the world's going, I talk about riding the wave tops. It's too slow. And so actually the best thing I have actually found for CEOs and, and boards, um, find a way to get different viewpoints brought in that, that, that help challenge your perspectives. And it has to be a diversity of perspectives. If you get people that are gonna tell you exactly what you already heard or what you know or what you already see, um, there's no value in that. Um, but one of the things I actually use as my own approach is I informally host at least once a month these informal salons that are intentionally non-attribution and they're non-partisan just to talk about what are we seeing? Uh, I also have several signal chat groups that I have created, same value, same principle. It's almost like the salons, but it's a daily basis that are incredibly lively. And those signal chat groups are almost my early warning network of, have you paid attention here? Have you looked here? And that's partly because by the time something is codified into a book or codified into an article, it may be out of date. Um, the other thing that I'm also seeing right now is because we have, you know, anytime there's a new technology or new technology capability, you know, always there's a bit of too much hype and there's also a little bit of too much doomsayism. In fact, I'd, I'd love to explore a few little more about your thoughts about there seems to be in some respects excessive doomsayism at the moment, in my opinion. And, and I say that as a pragmatist. But getting to the actual, like, what's the pragmatic? How does this change what your company needs to do or what your country needs to do? That takes a sort of good filter to, 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 to filter out the hype and the um, doomsayism. And in some cases, it's not the loudest voices. And so that curated network of people and viewpoints. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to be invited, like yourself, to sometimes sort of give perspectives and give things that CEOs can do. But I would submit that because the world is changing so fast, it's almost you've got to have a network approach to having people that 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 bring different actionable ideas to you um, to, to help inform what you do yourself as a C-suite leader. Okay, so you have these um, private salons and, and private chats. How can they join you <laughs> in chats in salons? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, obviously they can ping me and I'd be happy to. If, if, if they're looking for broader networks, I'm going to give a shout out to two groups that I have a lot of respect for. Uh, one is Constellation Research and Ray Wong. And, you know, I'm not, they don't, they don't employ me. I have no financial arrangement with them, but I find they're really good at sifting through the actual signal from the noise. And then the other one I would also recommend is a thing called HMG Strategy um, that do both virtual and in-person events. And they similarly they bring together, you know, there's some places that bring together people and it's just transactional and that's not my style. It really is. It's about the relationships you're building. And, and that's the sort of events that I try to look for. And so I would say as a C-suite leader, you know, you can take a look at those two. Look for places where you're building long-term relationships with people because, I mean, that's how, of course, we've known each other for more than a decade now. 
you know, you see things, I see things, we bounce ideas off each other, and that actually helps us stay aware of where the world is and where the world is going. I mean, you do a lot of advisory, um, but you're you're heavily scheduled. So do you still uh, go into companies if they want to bring you in and, you know, you know help them, yes. guide them in their adoption? Yes. I have a very understanding wife because you're right. It does. It is a lot of work. Um, but I also, my father was a Methodist minister. My mom was a school teacher. And you can imagine when he was a Methodist minister, I mean, his job was 24 seven. And so I look at it, the two things I'm really good at, it are the same things that my father was, which is healing fragmented congregations. But in this case, it may be fragmented. You know, if your company is, is currently fractured in terms of where it needs to go, or if it's fractured in terms of how it's going to use new technologies and data to move forward and almost reinvent itself. I'm great at that. And the other thing that he was good at that I'm good at as well is capital planning. So if you're saying like we need to do a transformation or, or a thing like that. And so I love to parachute into companies that need someone that can think both at the 30,000 foot level for the board and the C-suite, but then translate it to the 50 foot level, implement and execute it, and then circle back up to the 30,000 foot level and keep that sort of ex you know going back and forth from strategy to tactics, strategy to tactics, and actually do something that's meaningful to help reinvent the company. So that gives um, a, a lot of people a trusted voice and a, and a guide and um, somebody with a, has a tremendous background that they can bring in to, um, you know, how work through all of this transition that's occurring. In fact, in, in my keynotes, I said it's a it's an interesting time because there's more, I mean, this is the way I put it. I said there's more change occurring in the next five years than the last two million years, right? So well Exactly. <laughs> and so, you how do you that. navigate that, right? Yeah. How do you navigate? And how do you navigate that? I mean, I tell people, um, I'm going to speak truth to you. I realize, you know, I'll do so diplomatically, but sometimes the initial response when companies or countries or organizations are challenged with things they thought were true that are no longer true, there is a grieving process. You know, if, if a company thought that, you know, we were doing great and now we realize we're not, uh, there, there can be everything from denial to bargaining to getting angry. And so part of what I sometimes find myself doing is both bringing, bringing data and evidence about why they need to go a certain way and why they need to change what they're doing, but then also handling what I call um, in AI, I call it deployment empathy, that you can't just roll out AI. You have to recognize this is going to change how your employees work. This is going to change how you engage your customers or clients. This is going to change your processes. It's all the additional things that are not just about the tech. Um, and if you don't think about those things, whether it's AI, bio, or space, you may find that you succeed in getting the technology, but you've not brought along the organization, the country, the, the company, whatever it may be, to buy into that. You know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, and especially in the healthcare space, uh, so I, I'm in fact, I'm meeting with one of the founders of uh, a family founding group of some of the top medical companies in the world, and they would definitely could use some of the things you mentioned today. I'm just wondering, and, and these um, interviews are unscripted. Can you give me an updated profile for the link of some of the areas that you're connected with that sure. I could say, you yeah. know, Take a look at David. Take a look at this interview. Here are some resources, and you can pull them in as well. In, in fact, I could do an introduction, that yep. kind of thing. But they can get a good idea of the like the health initiative. I thought that's amazing, and, and definitely needed, right? On the right. ability side, can you give me an updated profile with those links in it? I'll get you an updated profile, and let me give you a few more examples of some of the things. So, um, behind the scenes. Uh, again, I, I'm one of those people that likes to think strategically, but act pragmatically and practically. And so one of the things that I've also been helping out with Top Coder, top, and, and this is me just helping because I think it needs to be done. Um, again, what are tangible things that can be done to use AI that can benefit society? So one is uh, I actually championed a open source competition to see if anyone could write an open source bot that says, I'll take this government form, be it a federal government form, state or local, whatever, and translate that form into a conversation that I can have with the person. And you can actually fill out the form as a conversation as opposed to having to fill out the form. And so that competition has actually been successful. There, there's actually been some winners, but I point to that because that code's open source and so people can reuse it. And now we're getting ready to do another competition, which is how can you make sure for a GPT 
that if you upload a frequently asked series of questions, so questions and answers specifically, that the that the GPT will only answer the questions with the answers it's been given. And if you ask it a question that doesn't match one of the questions and answers that's already been given, it will honestly say, I can't answer that question, but I will alert a human to try and get an answer to that. And so instead of having the problems of hallucination or things going off the rail, we can have confidence. And the reason why we're doing that is I'm actually helping an effort called Birth to Three. Um, and this is actually a nonprofit that I'm helping pro bono with, but it's about ensuring that every child born anywhere in the world has the necessary physical, emotional, and physical care between the ages of birth to age three to thrive. And of course, one of the things we want to do is that, you know, caregivers can text and say, you know, what's the right way to put in a car seat or what's the right way to, you know, help get food for my child if I need assistance in getting food. And you want to make sure that the answers they're given are trustworthy because the last thing you want to do is tell them a wrong way to put in the car seat. And so having that confidence that the generative AI is only going to answer based on the questions and answers it's been given and not hallucinate. Um, the good news is we seem to be having success there. Yeah, this is amazing. And again, I, I, I'm doing all of these AMAs and um, CEO keynotes, and they're always looking for resources or areas that they can uh, that are trusted. So I'll, I'll definitely point to everything that's in your profile, and then also recommend them. They contact you directly, and, and and sometimes I may just do a direct connect, just do an introduction, say, "Hey, you two, explore working together in some way." <laughs> but you wear so many hats, so. Um, how are some of your other initiatives, <clears throat> excuse me, um, undergoing? I, I know you were working on some kind of space initiative. I, I'm not sure how much you could talk about it or not. I'll tell a little bit. Um, so partly what we're trying to do with the space initiative is think about how, how space capabilities plus air capabilities, plus ground capabilities. So, so think about what you can see from space, what you can see from air, what you can see from ground can be brought together in such a way that you can provide probably for the best word, exquisite insights. Uh, and I'll give an example. Uh, remember when the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal? Um, you know, no existing human analyst or AI approach would have known at the time, it was not designed to say that less than 48 hours after this ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, we're going to have a issue at uh, the port of Los Angeles because we're short on containers. But sure enough, we did. And then when we're short on containers, now we're going to actually start to see demand for more containers to be built because this ship was stuck. And when those containers are being built, the price of metals are going to go up. The futures market for metals are going to go up. And then as a third and fourth order effect, for the next six to nine months, plenty of expensive goods like Rolls Royces and expensive cars will be able to cross the ocean to get to the United States. But more modest price things like a quart-sized can of paint won't be able to because the cost of doing these more expensive shipping containers because that ship got stuck is too high. And it's sort of like these ripple effects. And that's something where deep learning is not going to be able to help you because deep learning with the current generations of AI is only as good if you've seen it before in your past data set. It's only as good as doing that. And so what we're looking at is how can we bring observations from space, observations from air, observations from economic and other terrestrial price signals to be able to do those ripple effects to tell a company or even a country, here are things that you need to get ahead of because these ripple effects are gonna happen. Uh, I'll give another practical example, and this comes from my past life. Uh, when I worked at the Centers of Disease Control with the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program, we had indications of the original coronavirus, SARS, happening about five and a half months uh, before China and, and, and the associated countries said we had an issue. And the way that we knew about it was one, the price of garlic is, had gone up tenfold in Southeast Asia and garlic seen as a cure-all. And so when you see a price in that economic signal, it tells you something. But the other thing I can say is while we weren't tracking individual people, we could see there were more cars in parking lots, the reflectivity of cars in parking lots around hospitals and not around factories. Um, and so these non these non obvious patterns of life that are are going on in the planet can give sentinel indicators that indicate to businesses, indicate to countries something's going to happen. And then you can extrapolate and say, if this is happening, how is that going to impact futures markets? How is that going to impact supply chains? All sorts of things like that. Um, so yeah, that's one of the fun things we're working on too. So how do people get access to this? Uh, how, I... How can they engage and say, I, I Have want a to conversation <laughs> It's probably the best way. So yeah, um, you know, they can obviously reach out. Um, 
one of the things we want to do is do so consistent with the values of, of what we think are, are common decent standards. We obviously want to use this as a force for good, which I know resonates with you. Um, I'll give one other example too. And this, this now crosses over to some of the work I do in bio. Um, and I'm, I, and I consider myself incredibly fortunate that I can work across all these different technology fields, but um, I have seen that through natural processes, it's you're able to create a natural bacteria. So not synthetic or anything like that. It sits through computational biology. You can actually select for a bacteria that's really good at using methane as a sugar source. And this matters because we know that methane is between 22 and 40 times as bad as carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So if we use methane as a sugar source and methane can come from either natural gas extraction or from cows belching, um, if we use methane as a sugar source, we remove that dangerous greenhouse gas from the environment. And at the same time, what it does is it uses nitrogen that's in the air and returns it to the soil. So it's almost a two, two, two for a win. You, you not only remove this dangerous greenhouse gas, but you actually make the soil more fertile. The challenge is, is how do you translate that into a business model? Because you can't see bacteria. How do you know if you had an effect? Well, again, if we can observe from space that there's these methane blooms and that there's these problems, and we can also observe from space that your soil is no longer as good as it used to be because you over farmed it, then you can imagine that there's a business case for write a check, you know, maybe half deposited now or half put in escrow. The remediation is done using the bacteria. And then in a week or two later, you, you pass over the same place from space and you show methane's gone. Yes. And at the same time, the nitrogen has been returned to your soil you know, removes the, the money that's been put in escrow and, and deliver on the service. And so we're actually able to use economic free market principles to solve both climate change and agricultural issues. Um, and so that's also something that I'm working on behind the scenes that I feel really honored to because it's, it's really at that nice intersection of a thorny technology problem that has massive impacts for how we operate as a planet. So we're all excited and looking forward to seeing the updated profile with, with and some of the things you'll never see directly on my profile but i will make sure there's ways that people can reach me you know i mean as you know same thing with you like there's what you do that's visible on the surface and then everything else so yes <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, it's, it's all really uh, profound and amazing and and because you're involved then it's going to happen i mean just just I'm gonna, I, 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 are, right? anything i am persistent i think i, I the the I was on a phone call yesterday in which one of the former chairman of the FCCs that I worked for said, if there's anything I learned about Bray, it's that he's persistent. And I thought that was probably the highest compliment. So, yes. And you're resilient as well and agile. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> and you have that dendritic mind of yours, right? You know, this, this kind of, and I guess now the number of, of connections in the brain, I used to think it was 100 trillion, but reading this last analysis, they did this tissue sample and they found... Mm -hmm. The small tissue sample um, with 57,000 neurons, they found 150 million connections. So, so now I, I say that the connections in the brain are probably 250 trillion, not 100 mm. trillion. Neurons. Which means, which easily means that that's way more than all the stars in our galaxy. Which is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. About that. So, <laughs> okay, so, you know, every time we have a discussion, so we, we, we know that you're like, uh, a human form, but you know, uh, ten. I'm not a bot judge. Really times but a quintillion times better. Uh, GPT-4 Omni, right? Whereas this one model's trained on everything, so everything's integrated. It's no latency. Well, you're you, you, what you do. You, you're you're this one hub or model that you can go to, and you can give you multimodal input, and you'll get multimodal output because you work across so many domains, right? So it's very very efficient. And 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 we've seen some of that. We're going to see that in the updated profile, or people who want to get in touch with you and we say, "Hey, Dave, can you come on and help us?" Right. So, mm -hmm. okay. Now let's let, let's do a little bit of free free um, wheeling here in terms of where things are going. So, in my keynotes, I say now there's over eighty plus leadership changes happening this year. Yes. So, what are the implications of that? Good question. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm including I'm, in your country and in my country. Yes, there might be something happening in November. We might have heard about it. Um, yes. So I'm actually. So I got asked uh, a few months ago uh, through the National Academy of Public Administration and George Mason University uh, to see if I would be willing as a non as someone who has served in government in a nonpartisan capacity as a senior executive 
to try and organize a four-part course for existing senior executives. And for folks in the audience not familiar with what are senior executives in government, um, there are the people that are politically elected, including, as you mentioned, there may be something happening in November. There are then the people that the politically elected people appoint. There are political officials that can either be presidentially appointed or presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed. And then there's these nonpartisan senior executives that are kind of like the flag officers or kind of like the admirals or generals that translate whatever direction the politicals give to the rest of the career workforce. Um, and having served as one, I often say your, your digital diplomat and human flag jacket or possibly the punching bag between what the political will wants and what you need to get done. And you have to help make it happen. And it's it really is an exercise in servant leadership. And so what I've been trying to do is actually see if we wanted to have a conversation right before the election, right after the election to, sell, to sort of say, what are we gonna do with AI and emerging technologies for the next four years? Because now's the time to think about it, reflect on it, whether the president changes or not, you know, let's get ahead of it. Um, I am finding right now people don't want to stick their necks out. Not, And this is not everybody. There are some people that are willing, but a lot of people don't want to stick their necks out, which is worrisome to me, because as you know, how fast the world is changing. And we we're just talking about that fast OODA loop where, you know, if CEOs aren't talking to people and having their views challenged on a weekly basis, they're going to fall behind. If we're essentially saying we want to wait almost more than six or seven months before we think about what we want to do as, with AI as a country, you know, whether or not the president changes or not, that seems to be a missed opportunity. Um, and so, and that's not just us. I mean, I, I celebrate that Europe has been moving very far on the AI policy side. I am curious to see if Europe is going to connect what they're doing on the AI policy side with actual operations. Uh, Cause that's historically when disconnects have occurred. Um, and so I think the world is really in an interesting place. Um, the other thing, and, and I, 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 I don't normally go to Davos, but I went to Davos this year to actually host four roundtables. Um, and I liked it because it was actually two hour long conversations. You actually got to have deeper conversations. But it's clear. I mean, we're in a world right now where there's at least three regional crises going on in the world, regional conflicts. And we could have two or three more in the next uh, by the end of the year. And so I think we really need to do some serious conversations within countries, but also across countries, which is, you know, there's only one earth, you know, if, if we treat this as a winner take all or a win lose scenario, it's not gonna end well for anybody. So can we find ways to to do actually, I mean, I'm not Pollyannish, but we gotta figure out ways across public sector, private sector, and just local community assets. How do we figure out how do we move forward in a world in which if we're not careful, we might be repeating some of the mistakes of the early 20th century in terms of conflicts. Yeah, I mean, there's so much chaos occurring right now, or change. Maybe I should yes. use chaos that. and change, which are which, which can both be the same sometimes. So, <laughs> right. So, um, and and um, that creates uncertainty and and of course risk. And, how oh, whole lot, and there's a whole lot of geopolitical risk, which normally companies don't, unless you're a really big company, you don't think about geopolitical risk. But I would say, again, back to the good news is we've connected the internet to half the planet. The bad news is we connected the internet to half the planet. That means you need to think about if you're a small company, you could be a target. Yeah, you you, you can't sit in isolation anymore. Everything is so interconnected and, and something that you think is obscure and doesn't affect you will affect you. Right. Yes. So, so everybody should take this course. <laughs> well, and I would also say, um, and, and maybe this is a good point to pick out. Um, one of the things that I have found recently when I've been talking to you, Fortune 500 companies and, and other companies too, uh, you know, you're probably aware of how everyone's pushing for zero trust in the cyber domain. You know, how do we, you know, how do we make sure we, we, we don't build anything that's at the software layer dependent on something else that could get compromised. But we're finding that a lot of people haven't thought about the hardware. Um, and so I'm working, I'm working on with a small company that's actually successfully been able to demonstrate they can actually verify if that hardware is valid or not, if it's really doing what it's supposed to be doing or not. But I would submit every company. And again, if you're the CEO and you're like, well, someone's got that handled, I'd ask them, have you taken the time to validate if your hardware is really doing what you think it should be doing or not? Because you may end up doing 
almost everything right in the software realm, only to realize that the castle, that the, the, the foundation of the castle you built, the sand on, you built it on sand, in this case, on hardware that was not tested, was not verified. You thought it was okay because you got it from that supplier, but even the supplier might not know that that hardware has been compromised. Yeah, it's a, it's a very complex uh, scenario. And in fact, I remember in 2018, um, when I was doing keynotes, or even 2017, I was saying there's maybe 30 to 40 billion security events per day. <laughs> so, and that was uh, then, and I, you could easily probably quadruple that or 10x that probably now. So yes, it's only getting more and more widespread. Yes. And, and you don't know what's happening. You know, 99% or the bulk of them, you don't even know they're occurring, right? So and and how do you manage that? And and so, like you said, it has to be a full spectrum kind of analysis. And and you and if you don't do that, you're vulnerable. So it's great that you're addressing that in in a thoughtful way. And and again, David Bray, this is the kind of the hub of everything, right? No, okay, it's so. mutual, my friend. I think I mean I, you're you're definitely a hub yourself, Stephen. Thank you for it. <laughs> so, so, so we talk about this uh, leadership changing ac across the planet. So it's an inflection point uh, in terms of global stability in many yep. ways, right? And, and and with regards to that, there's all these conflicts occurring. Okay, now let's shift to another topic. And you know, in, in this keynote I did to CEO just a few weeks ago in, in Geneva, I talked about Microsoft. Uh, with uh, Quantinium working, and they created this system that's 800 times more stable, less errors. And then shortly after, there, there was an announcement about triple nine and maybe even going to four nine uh, fidelity in these uh, quantum uh, logical qubits. And if you can get this kind of stability, then you can and you can scale it, then you can get the, the universal quantum computing. So. Uh, and it's such a rapidly changing field, and there's a lot of work on room temperature semiconductors, and and then there's claims, and then they, the claims are are solid, but there's more claims coming out all the time that we're getting closer, right? So, and then Microsoft released earlier uh, this year this Microsoft Quantum Elements, where they said, you know what? Let's see if we can combine exascale or supercomputing with AI machine learning. And with uh, maybe quantum inspired computing in some aspect and work on a real problem. So they did. They actually applied it to looking at 33 million novel materials. And so they came up with this new battery uh, material, um, which is 70% less lithium, for example. So it can solve real problems. So I'd like to get your perspective on the quantum computing side. And then we'll get into semiconductors and AI machine learning and and Omni was released on Monday, and now uh, people are going to get access to it. And, and, and you know, you saw uh, Google do their I.O. conference, and Apple's going to do their one <laughs> shortly. So you're going to see some more innovation occurring. And so we'll address each of these topics in the remaining time. So first of all, quantum computing or quantum information technology. Right. Or quantum information science and technology, maybe, because it's much broader than just computing. It is much broader. You're right. Um, so one, you're absolutely right that that we're we're really getting very close to the cusp of this actually being sufficiently stable qubits with enough error correction that you can, and as you said, like Microsoft's already demonstrated, they could actually tackle some interesting issues. I think, and and I will say, I'm actually working with an initiative that's trying to think about how you can make quantum computers available to people beyond just those that are in the quantum computing environment. It's almost in some respects, think about it as, um, uh, you know, how, uh, how can you have a decentralized approach where you can almost get, you know, you can send either queries to a quantum computer to say, can you run the following for me? Almost like the old timeshare model on mainframes, but obviously much faster within the fractions of a second in which, you know, the qubits are stable or that you can actually say, like, I've got this really hard problem. Are you available? Do you have the bandwidth to actually spread this across multiple quantum computers? If you're familiar with um, SETI at home, can we do a SETI at home approach in which you can actually have a web of different quantum computers? A and you're obviously right. What this allows us to do in a past life, back in the mid nineties, I was doing protein folding. And that was to try and figure out if we could find novel drugs for fighting cancer. Um, and so you had to figure out how the protein would fold and if it would fit the receptor, but that took a lot of compute power and a lot of time. Um, obviously we've seen some advances with AI get better at protein folding, 
But as you pointed out with the Microsoft example, once you have the the fact that you can do things massively in parallel um, with 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 the simultaneity that a quantum waveform gives you, as opposed to being constrained by von Neumann architectures and having to do things in series, the space in which we can expand our search parameters for novel materials, novel therapies, novel drugs. Um, novel models in terms of how we're going to tackle things like climate change or novel models about how we're going to actually identify if your supply chain has been vulnerable or not or compromised or not. That gets incredibly powerful. And in some respects, you don't have to actually come in with a formal model to solve the problem. You can actually just throw enough data at it and see if the quantum waveform collapses to a, a, a elegant solution. Um, and so I think we are going to find some very interesting things that are going to surprise them. At the same time, I am I am remaining somewhat cautious because I don't want to just look for things that fit the data, because I think there's always a risk that you might find an elegant solution that's not reality. We need to make sure we also upgrade what I would call our our, our theories for how different elements from chemistry to bio to physics to how populations work at the local level, populations work at the global level. Let's make sure we also upgrade our actual logic too, in addition to finding solutions. Yeah, and then, and then there's like quantum networks and quantum communications. And... Oh yeah, quantum key distribution in some respects, you know, <laughs> right when quantum computers arrive to break encryption, we'll have the ability to know if you're quantum, you know, if, if someone's at least tampered with what you were talking about, yes. Yeah, I mean, and, um... Again, at this keynote, I talked about Clarissa Yellow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I would say she's probably the foremost expert on quantum biology. It's interesting. Quantum biology was such an outlier. People are ignoring it. <laughs> there's so much more evidence coming to suggest there's something else going on. And, you know, there's the poster children of uh, photosynthesis. I was going to say photosynthesis. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or, 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 bird, or insects and birds migrating. There's something else going on that can't be explained just through clear uh, classical techniques. So she's trying to apply it, to see if we can get some kind of measurable way and to control this and, and alter it so that it can help in um, therapies or, or diagnosis and so on. Do, do you have any thoughts about quantum going at, at, at room temperature in cells and it's actually yeah. biology? And well, and then you pointed out, I mean, I think when we discovered that there were actually quantum processes occurring in photosynthesis, that should have been the wake up call for the skeptics that somehow quantum could occur um, in cells. Um, but I think, and then as you said, again, then recognizing that it appears that's actually how birds can navigate as well using that phenomenology. And what I'm really excited about because again, you know, there's all, all these questions about do we humans have free will or not? You know, is everything if you if you do the reductionist model, indicating, but if you do the reductionist model of the human brain, you know, are we simply deterministic at the end of the day? That if you give us the same inputs, we're going to respond the same way each time. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe five, 10, 15 years from now, we find there are some quantum processes happening in our brain, as you mentioned, just the sheer number of neurons which would be great because in some respects that does give us back free will. <laughs> and so, so I'm quietly rooting for that. If anything, just because it, 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 it pushes back against the reductionist model of how people think. Yeah. In fact, what I'm doing is I'm resurfacing um, some of the work I've done or some of the interview kind of, or interaction I've had with Roger Penrose because um, I did it back in a, in a keynote to CEOs back in 2019, but I thought, it was considered such an outlier yes. <laughs> because of the work with quantum biology. And, and now people are going, hmm, maybe, maybe there's something to what he's been saying for, for decades, right? That there's some kind of quantum effects happening. Okay, let's let's shift to, so we went into quantum compute or quantum science, and then we went into quantum our, our biology. Now let's shift to chip technology. Uh, and, and a lot of people used to think that a chip you have to fa fabricate, you don't. I mean, uh, NVIDIA doesn't fabricate their chips. They design the chips and then they get fabricated. Right. They want semiconductor and things like that. And that brings its own problem, right? Centralized fabs and the vulnerability to the global sort of supply chain because you were relying, or ASML in, in the Netherlands in terms of the production of the equipments to produce. But let, let's let's put that aside for a moment. 
there's this whole chip revolution that's occurring, right? Uh, chips on the edge, uh, chips with AI embedded in them, system on a chip. Uh, you see NVIDIA with their Blackwell with 208 billion transistors. I mean, my iPhone has an A17 Bionic chip and it has, I don't know, uh, 19 a billion transistors or something like that. And it could do 33 trillion operations per second. I mean, the, the whole chip area is just exploding. I know, and, and how, 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 like you said, I mean, we're getting to like three nanometers. I can remember when people said, we'll never go past 11 nanometers. And yeah, even sub, sub three, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what, what are your views on all of this? And, and where is that going? And of course, there's all of this uh, fear in the US and that, you know, that there's a chip back, right? Right. And in fact, even Taiwan Semiconductor is doing a, um, um, facility in the U.S. with the support from the U.S. government. So. Yes. So um, it's 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 interesting because if you remember, like the last decade, there was the the phrase that, you know, software eats the world. I'm like, mm, hardware still matters. And I think we're, re we're not... rediscovering that hardware still matters, yeah, uh, especially for AI. Um, so my concern is I think we're, we may be approaching a a, a a cold war in terms of chips that somehow the US thinks that if it limits availability of its advanced AI chips, which you know aren't even necessarily grown in this you know, or built in this in this country, but if it limits the availability of those chips, that will somehow have beneficial effects for for the US's interests. And I'm not sure that's the case. Because as it is, the US itself is dependent from chips from other countries, including that country where it may be saying you don't get AI chips. And as I mentioned, um I'm increasingly seeing signs that for whatever reason, it could be for intentional reasons or just misconfiguration. Um, I don't know if it would surprise you if, I've, if I told you I've seen cases where people went to warehouses in which people said everything in this warehouse is exactly what it says it is. And when they run deep hardware interrogation on it um, without giving specifics on the entity, more than 65% of the equipment in that warehouse failed. You know, and so, you know, that that is the scale in which we're operating. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything has been compromised intentionally. It's just it's not what you think it is in terms of the hardware. And so just like how we're rediscovering that chips matter and that hardware matters, I think we may discover that we have this 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 we, we built instead of building on a solid rock foundation, we built on sand in some cases really with silicon. But um I, I I'll be interested to see as the different boundaries come online, do we actually find that that one, while this is good that we're actually paying attention to hardware, that every country, including the United States and others, has actually overbuilt capacity? And does that change in about two or three years where we actually have really cheap chips because everybody's overbuilt? Um, or does, does the, do people just put the accelerator on and we continue to build really great chips and now we actually build in better security, maybe even privacy features and things like that? Um, but I do worry that people aren't paying enough attention to the actual security of the hardware, let alone how, I mean, you know, I mean, there are ways you can influence what a processor does, even if you're far away right. by radio signals and things like that. And so, as well as what you can pick up from the processor. And so um, I think we're going to have to help chief information security officers. Maybe it's chief hardware security officers. Maybe it's a new term this whole physics of making sure the hardware and the chips are doing what you think it should be doing and nothing else. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, such a rapidly evolving area. And, you know, we're really getting the scaling in a million times in a few years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Jensen, of course, uh, Jensen Wong of, of NVIDIA, but all of them are riding the wave, right? But Jensen's sort of the beneficiary. <laughs> Well, he was at the right time at the right and remember i mean right before chat gpt came out there were concerns that because everyone had bought graphics processors during the early days of COVID, that there was going to be a glut in the market and that nvidia stock was going to go down and here comes chat gpt right to have you know so good timing <laughs> yeah good timing but really he's been invested in this as the 90s right right in different ways right so uh and he's a nice guy <laughs> he's a nice guy. he's a nice guy and it's also i mean both for nvidia and other chip manufacturers the other thing we need to think about is chips in space um okay. one of the things when i do brief people is that all trends at the moment are um 
we will probably have more processing power in space in the next five years than Google uses right now on a daily basis to build its search index. Um, and so when you have cloud computing in space, a whole lot of interesting questions emerge, both what are you gonna use it for? But if a financial transaction happens in space, whose taxes do you pay if anybody's taxes um, and things like that? And there's vulnerabilities too, though, in space. Oh, massive vulnerabilities. And and then also if you need to actually access that data, you know, like we're in, in, in you know, if heaven forbid that someone does something criminal and stores that information on a, on a, on a, you know, SSD or a similar device, but at least in, in the ground, they can actually like, you know, they can get a court order and they can obtain that. But if you're in space and it's going at 1,500 miles an hour at low Earth orbit, uh, I don't think we have the space police to pull the hard drives. So, yes. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're uh, quickly running out of time and we're not going to be able to address every one of these kind of curious areas. Um, but, you know, we, we can't ignore AI machine learning, right? And we... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh -oh. it is the issue of the day. <laughs> yeah, since November of, of 2022, and everybody kind of got shocked, and then it sort of escalated in 2023, and just the rapid um, release of updates, right? And and the fact that it seems to be following scaling laws of, of, you know, like the more you put in, the more you get out, and they're getting better at making the data better to to, to train these things. But I, I watched all of the videos on the Omni, right? And I noticed on my phone now, I can choose Omni. So all the features aren't there, but uh, this Omni model looks really, really interesting. And it's just an incremental upgrade. Have right. you looked at it? And where do you think this is going? Well, I mean, it's clearly going to, we're, we're, we're going to have digital assistants. I mean, that, 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 that is what this is. And that's, I think, you know, and Sam Altman and others have said, we're going to give you digital assistants. I think the question I have is one of the things when I, I, I say this with all candor and I say this with love to the to, to companies and countries and organizations and communities, but I, at the end of the day, as you know, I worked with Vince Surf at the People Centered Internet Coalition. And I'm concerned that right now, a lot of these models for the current flavor of Gen AI, there's questions about where did the data sets come that trained them? What are you doing with the prompts when the prompts are given? You know, is this really my digital assistant or is it really you're brokering it and I have no idea what you're doing with everything else? And even if they say we're not taking your data, I'm sure they're recording the metadata. And so um, in some respects, I wish that we would see companies and maybe there's some of the ones that could be, they could use this as an interesting moat, unlearn some of the lessons of the last decade. You know, if you remember the last decade, there was that phrase, Data is the new oil, which I thought was quite frankly awful because I was like, oil, use it up, it's gone. The <laughs> data, use it, it's still there. So the net, it doesn't work as an analogy. But on top of it, the more that you actually get the people associated with the data, the stakeholders of the data to use the data, the better the data gets. You actually create more data and metadata and you actually get better value. You unlock value by involving the community in their data. And so I'd love to see a model in which there is data stakeholderism, not ownership, but stakeholderism in which, you know, that digital, the, the, I see the world is probably gonna be, we're all gonna have 20 or 30 or more personal digital assistants, each doing different things. That of course requires interoperability, which I don't know if anybody has currently thought about interoperability between AI, but it also requires the confidence that they're, they're using my data only with my consent and permission. And we've thought about what does informed consent and permission look like for everybody, not just someone who's a data scientist. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, definitely a, a series of inflection points and, and the rapidity of, of these changes, these inflection points are like daily. Um, oh, and you think about how it can be used to like, it can be used to improve. I mean, there's so many good things that can happen. Right. Uh, and that's actually where uh, I know we're getting close on time, but I would say, I often try to say, what if we replace the Turing test where you're trying to fool the machine or tr fool a human, whether it's a machine or a human? What if we replace that with instead the question of, how are our current processes and performance doing either for the individual, the community, or a company? And then if we bring in these AI assistants and these AI activities and agents, how do we uplift and improve the individual, the community, the company? And so it's really about using AI, not to fool whether or not it's human or not, but actually uplift and actually define it as that and actually work on metrics as to what does that look like? Because it's going to, you know, it's going to depend on whether you're doing healthcare or business, 
uh, trying to do sales, trying to improve communities. The other thing I would say right now, I wish that we could actually, well, it, obviously it's going to get harder and harder to distinguish what's authentic and what's inauthentic online. And, and it seems like right now there's a whole lot of, dare I say, inauthenticness going on, human or machine. And so I got asked about a week ago to give a talk on authentic leadership to a group of C-suite executives. And they said, how do you make decisions as an authentic leader? And I said, well, the first thing you need to recognize is that authentic leadership cannot be done as an individual. If you do it as an individual, you're killed, metaphorically or realistically. It's got to be a team sport. Everyone has to buy into authentic leadership in the community or company or government. But then two, I say, you know, you need to have a sounding board where you give them permission to tell you if they if they think you're doing something wrong or doing something silly or stupid. So have that sounding board Two, learn to look at the data and recognize that data might be missing things or might have gaps, but look at the data, but also recognize it could be missing or bias. Three, have a sense of what your own moral compass is and, and compare those three things. But then the two other things that maybe this is where AI could help us, or maybe we could just practice better self-reflection how wrong do we have to be for our decision in the moment to change? Recognizing it's a decision in the moment and more data may cause us to pivot or change, which leads to the final thing, which is as a leader, whenever you make a decision before you move forward, think about the possible pivots you might do if new data comes along or you realize you're gonna to have to change your position because you've tried it and you've discovered it is it's not working or there's a need to shift. And if you do those five things, I hope maybe we can use a combination of technology, but also just general human centeredness and, and communities to be more authentic as leaders. I mean, David, you've been out there for such a long time because you started when you were a teenager. So. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> You're not that old yet, but um, I, I mean, I remember when strategic planning was like 10 year time frames and even five year, oh, three year time frames. You can't even. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, this is the last question. A any sort of question you want to throw to the audience or recommendations, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I guess I think for the que the audience, it would be, you know, in a world again in which we're overwhelmed and we're, we're, we're flooded with so much change, so many decisions had to be made, questions of authentic and inauthenticness. I think the question for the audience to consider is um, what have they done that week as a positive action to help a broader set of community members beyond themselves. Because I think if everybody takes that practice of mindfulness to say, you know, I can't do it necessarily, you know, hopefully they can do it every day, but if you can't, what can you do once a week that is helping to uplift a community beyond yourself? Um, that can be an incredible, given there's 8.1 billion people on the planet, that can be an incredible force for good. And so I guess the question I would leave is, is reflect on what can you do beyond yourself? Um, because I think if we all do that, one, there's a lot of research that shows people are actually happier if they do help others beyond themselves. But then two, I think our world needs it at the moment, because there's, like you said, there's a lot of change and chaos. But if we each do a small part to help improve, that could be a, a huge net effect for the world. No, it's interesting, you know, this kind of the pay the pay it forward uh, message. And you mentioned um, a challenge of a, of a week, but with you, it's like per minute. <laughs> so. Well, I had I had good role models. My, I I give all credit not only to my parents, but I, I you and others. I have good role models in which I feel like yeah, it's part of it's part of the role. You know, if, if, there, if there's something to life, it's if if you can help where you can. So uh, thank you again, David, for coming in and doing this uh, really interesting, engaging interview. And I, I really, I recommend the audience uh, reach out to David. He's just an amazing individual. He executes. He definitely has a, he's the hub of the world in a sense and one person. So that creates enormous e efficiencies <laughs> in, in terms of execution and insight. And of course, he's going to give you an updated profile. So I'll get you an updated profile. Like, yes. <laughs> And uh, thank you again for coming in. I always enjoy engaging with you. So. Same here, Stephen. And I look forward to when we can break bread together. Thank you again. And thank you for everything you do too. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, 
Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.